worship. So I want to invite you to take a Bible today, please, and turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 16. The book of Romans, which you'll find in the New Testament. You'll see the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts, and then the book of Romans. And we're at the way end of the book, chapter 16. We're finishing up the church series today. This is our last time together in this series, and just a quick review where we've been. We started out weeks ago, and we saw that in the church, Jesus is called in the Bible the lead pastor, or the senior pastor, or the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5 of everyone who is a follower of his. He is the leader of the church, and then he has appointed elders, or Uh, under shepherds, pastors, to serve each local congregation. So Jesus is the leader of his church, but he has called men to serve in plurality as elders of each individual singular congregation. And then we saw the second week that God has called us all to serve, that the church is not a building, it's a people, and he wants us to be his servants as the church. And Yet he has also given a specific office, not just of elder pastors, but of deacons who are official servant ministers of mercy in the congregation that are leading in that front. And then our third time together, we just really focused on the truth that who is the church? You are the church. The saints, the people of God are the church. The church is not an organization or a building or an entity. It is the people that have met the chief shepherd Jesus and have followed him. And then our last time together, we simply spent time in Acts looking at the fact that not everyone who goes to a church service is actually a member of the church. That God's people are called in the Bible sheep and he's the the lead pastor or the chief shepherd. But there are also sometimes goats that come into the congregation and wolves that would come into the congregation. We looked at those metaphors in the Bible and saw how important it is for the church to seek to love and convert the goats, but also, of course, to drive away the wolves from herding the sheep. And we have come to this point today in Romans 16 where I want us to consider one more important facet of the church, and that is what is called the communion of the saints, the communion of the saints. Heard a story not too long back about a little town that had only four churches in it. And and the four churches were Presbyterian and Methodist and Pentecostal and Baptist. And all four of these churches had the same problem. And the problem was that squirrels were getting in through the roof And it was a very squirrely problem, if you will, in these four congregations. And so each one of these bodies had a way to deal with the squirrel problem differently. So the Presbyterian congregation believed that by the foreknowledge of God, it was elected sovereignly that the squirrels would be a nuisance to the church. And so they just let them be. They didn't really act on it. And the Pentecostal congregation, they laid hands on the squirrels, And they named it and claimed it that the squirrels would not return. But they were back the following Sunday. And the Methodist congregation, uh, in the spirit of Charles and John Wesley, decided they would do the humane thing and show love to the squirrels. And so they safely captured them, and they took them to the park a couple miles down the road. But sadly, in two weeks, the squirrels had made their way back to the church building. And so, of course, the Baptists had the wisest solution to the problem of these squirrels coming in the building. They simply called a business meeting and took a vote, and they made the squirrels members of that local church. From then on, they only saw them at Christmas and Easter. It was amazing how that worked out. What is the communion of the saints? What is this idea of communion amongst believers? Well, I looked up Webster's 1828 dictionary, kind of an authority on the English language. Webster said the word communion means this, fellowship, a state of giving and receiving, agreement and concord, where there's a a union in religious worship and in beliefs and practice. So Webster goes on in one of his definitions to say it this way, 
The communion is the body of Christians who have a common faith and a common discipline. So when we said the creed earlier today, we confessed our faith to God, we said we believe in the communion of saints. And when we said that, we were expanding our definition of the word family. Because you see, when we are united with Christ, we don't just have an earthly family that God has given us anymore. We have a spiritual family, a universal family, an invisible family, meaning we might not be able to recognize this family immediately on the outside, but on the inside, we are united as one in Jesus. At one time, we were strangers, we were separated from one another, and now we use the terminology of brothers and sisters and church family and body as one in Christ. You look around at the sanctuary at those who are gathered here today, and I've said it many times before, but it's worth repeating. With few exceptions, most of us probably would not have anything to do with one another if it were not for Jesus and the church. Now, I don't say that as an insult. It's not like we wouldn't like each other. It just simply means the fact is that we probably would not be a part of each other's lives. Our geographical location, some of us come from Santa Rosa County, some of us come from Nine Mile Road, some of us come from Warrington, some of us are coming from Alabama. You know, we're, we're all over the place, yet we're meeting together here even though we have different geographical locations. Secondly, we have different cultural backgrounds. Some of us have different skin colors than others. We have different first languages than others in the congregation. Some of us have different financial status or lack of financial status. Where else can you get a doctor and a lawyer, a wealthy man and a homeless man, an African and an Asian, a Jewish person and an Arab, and one more for fun, a Southerner and a Yankee, all together and be in love and peace and harmony? Where else can that happen but under the love and hands of Jesus? Now, the communion of the saints means that my family picture is incomplete without you because I'm united to Jesus and you're united to Jesus, we're united to each other. And this means very simply that as Martin Luther said in his small catechism, the communion of saints is union with Jesus Christ, not because of a building, not because of a denomination, but union with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. Let me read you what one more statement has said, the Westminster Confession. It says, all saints, meaning the church, you, the congregation, the people, all saints are united to Jesus as their head, by his spirit, and by faith we have fellowship with him in grace, in suffering, in death, in resurrection, in glory. We are united to one another in love, and we have communion in each other's gifts and grace. And then the statement says this, Saints, by our profession, are bound to maintain a holy fellowship and a communion together in the worship of God. You see, the communion of saints means we're a family, but not just here. We're a family with other churches in this community that love Jesus. With other churches throughout the United States of America that love Jesus. With other churches and other continents all across this world. We find unity not necessarily in our financial background or in our culture or in our language. We find family and unity in the one whose blood is thicker than water. The Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and died for us. I want to prove that to you today from Romans chapter 16. So look with me there. We're going to read the end of the book, verses 1 through 16, and then 21 through 24, and we'll ask God to help us to understand his word. Romans 16. I commend to you, Paul says, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, that you might assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus 
who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who were of note among the apostles, who were also in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. And Stachus, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who were of the household of Aristobulus. Greet our Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who were of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother in mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philo, Logus, and Julia, Nerus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Look at verse 21. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Quartus, a brother. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Join me in prayer, please. Our Father, we confess that your word is alive. And the names we have heard today and the truths that have been said about these men and women have great importance and bearing on our hearts and lives because you have given us these, your words. So may May you protect us and keep us from glossing over this truth. May we take seriously that not one dot or one letter of your law will pass away till all of it has been fulfilled. And I pray today that we would see the value of Christian family, the value of having brothers and sisters, and not just here in this building, but brothers and sisters throughout the city and around this world. Our God, that we would love this truth of the communion of saints and we would find our unity in your son Jesus for this is where only true unity can be found and we will give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. The book of Romans is a lofty book. It is often called and considered a theological book. In fact, it is often uh, usually left to the theologians to try to tackle some of Romans, which is quite unfortunate because friends, this book, as well as all books of the Bible, were not written for trained seminary theologians. We are all called to be those who love God and want to know God and know his word. And the book of Romans is no exception. And the proof of that is found here when we read the end of the book and see who Paul was writing it to. He was writing it to ordinary people with funny sounding names to the 21st century Christian. I mean, he was writing to normal people who are part of the body of the church in Rome. And so this whole book is for us and for you. But especially as we look at the end of it, there are 27 names mentioned in verses 1 through 16. Two others not mentioned by name. We see Rufus's mother and Nerus's sister. There are eight first names mentioned in verses 21 to 24. To break it down a little more, to look at the anatomy of what this means, 17 men are mentioned. Ten women are mentioned. Two married couples are mentioned. And two persons of distinction are mentioned. And families are mentioned. Now, it's important to understand Paul's not in Rome, but he considers all of these people family. He cares about all of them deeply. He knows them. He has a connection to them. And the connection is not geography. 
The connection for many of them is not ethnicity. The connection is surely not financial. The connection is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amazing. So what I want to do is just kind of do an airplane ride over these verses and highlight some wonderful truths that show us why we should value the communion of the saints. I also want to remind you today, in a day where Christians are feeling alienated and alone, that as Elijah felt that way in the Old Testament, God said, I have reserved many who have not bowed the knee to Baal and the false gods. And I want to say to you today that we are not alone in the life we're living, that God has given us family, and we need each other desperately. In fact, one theologian, Augustine, and many others that followed after him have made statements like this. One cannot have God as his father who does not have the church as his mother. Now, I'm not sure how all that works out theologically, but the point of it is we need each other to have a close relationship to God. And so Paul demonstrates that here. So let's just dive right in for a minute. Look at verses 1 and 2. Paul begins with a recommendation. He says, I commend unto you this woman, Phoebe, a servant of the church in Centria, our sister. Now, Paul is in the city of Corinth as he's writing these words. Centria is a port city of Corinth, about maybe seven miles away, give or take. And Paul is mentioning this woman by name and saying, I'm commending her to you. I need you to take care of her to help her. Now this is important because there's a lot of people out there that say they're in need that are really not in need, right? A lot of deception in the world, is there not? I mean, we know as a church, we get phone calls sometimes daily. People that are in need. And we try to help as a church those we can. And we have to have guidelines to help us in that. But the reality is there are many people that call many churches every single day trying to take advantage instead of genuinely needing help and guidance. And so Paul begins with a recommendation for this woman. He calls her our sister in the Lord. But he says also, she has been a help to us. She has been a servant. Now it's important to note that the word servant here is the Greek word a deacon. And when we read this here, this does not mean that she held the office of a deacon, but it means she was doing the work of a deacon in the church without a doubt. And we see that because of verse 2. It tells us about her. It says she has been a help. She has been a help and an encouragement. And let me tell you, I thank God for the body of Christ because I see Christians all the time being a help to one another. Being not just another name, not just another pew filler, but genuinely caring for one another. I mean, I commend you all last week. Last week we took an offering up for pastors starting churches all throughout North America, many of them who we will never meet face to face till we get to heaven, but many of you gave generously to help them. Many of you help one another out in this congregation, and you don't brag about it. You don't make it a Facebook status every time you do it. You don't pat yourself on the back. You don't know, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You are simply showing and being the love and the hands and feet of Jesus to those around you. What a powerful statement this is. Now, Phoebe had served in a port city there at Corinth. I can imagine she was used greatly to help Paul. I would imagine that she had the ministry of hospitality. She would take in strangers that were Christians who were on their way. And she would minister to them. Her family would help them. She would show kindness and generosity. I would imagine as well, women were very active in the first century church, which we'll discuss in another moment. And I can imagine she helped the poor. That one of the great ministries women had as a help in the first century was to rescue children who would be abandoned by their families. You see, in the first century, there were no welfare child services going on. And so what would often happen is when a family had too many daughters, which was usually more than one, they would end up leaving their daughters on the streets to either be killed or to be adopted by Christians. 
and many women in the first century, they were fighting against this evil of infanticide 2,000 years ago, and they would rescue these babies and take them in and raise them with the help of the church. She is called a help here. Now you say, why does she stand out in verses 1 and 2? Well, we believe it is quite plausible that either she accompanied the person who carried the letter of Paul to Rome, or she was the very one who carried the letter for Paul to Rome. And Paul says, you need to welcome her in the Lord. She is a guest. She is a sojourner. She is coming for a time, and you need to show the love of Jesus to her. I love how many in our church have a heart to help those who are traveling, those who are broken down on the side of the road, those who are guests walking into the doors for the first time, those who are military families and are sojourners in a strange city named Pensacola. And you take them in and you love them and you adopt them and you pray for them and you reach out to them. This is an important ministry. You give to them generously. Acts chapter 2 says it this way. Acts 2 says, in the early church, all who believed were together and they had all things in common. They would even sell their possessions and belongings and distribute to the proceeds to anyone who had need. You know, that's called generosity, isn't it? That's called taking your words and putting them to action. That's called Christianity, amen? That's true Christianity. And, and we need to be a people like that. And, and he says here, treat her as it becomes the saints. This is the way we treat family. We love one another. We help one another. When one weeps, we weep. When another suffers, we suffer. When another has need, we provide their needs. We are the church. Now, friends, this section goes on. And he begins to give all these names. And I just want to kind of summarize the few different types of people that are mentioned in these verses. Now, some people have said, how could Paul know all these people? Because in the beginning of Romans, Paul says that he's never been to Rome. He desires to go to Rome one day. And the answer is simple. He knows all these people, number one, because Paul's traveled all over the world. And he has met them in his travels, which means he was a true missionary. He was a true servant. He cared about people. He invested in people, even in people that he didn't live life with long. Just because you don't have a guarantee that someone's going to be in your life the rest of your life doesn't mean you should invest in them while they're in your life today. Amen. You might only get one chance to share the love of Christ. One chance to have that conversation. One chance to take them out for a meal. One chance to be used of God to provide for their needs when they're hurting. Look, our city is full of single moms that are hurting. Single dads that are struggling. Our city is full of people who are poor and are trying hard. Our city is full of those who are business owners and trying to lead and manage and be good stewards of what they have. And we all need each other, amen? We need to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this way. When you read these words, we also are reminded of what Jesus said in John 10. He said, I am the good shepherd, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls all of his sheep how? By name. He knows them. You know, when I read this, I thought one of the applications I need to share with this church body is in order for a church to be healthy, you should be able to do what Paul does here. In other words, Paul's not even living in Rome, never even been there, and he knows this many people by name, and he has this many relationships in the church. I want to say to you again for the 18,000th time, the church was never supposed to be a place like a movie theater where we march in single file, we stare at the back of heads, and we walk out single file at 12 o'clock sharp. The church is supposed to be a family. We are supposed to have relationship and care about one another. Yeah, I know that um, in a family, it can be messy sometimes. I've had Christmas meal before with my family. I know what it's all about, right? It's not always easy. But the fact of the matter is that if we all matter to God, we should matter to each other. And here, I would say a healthy church is a church where you know the people in the body. If you can come in and come out week after week and never have relationship, it is not functioning as the church God called it to be. Now, part of that is your responsibility, right? I've had someone 
actually I've had probably 100 people over the years make this statement to me. I stopped going to church because when I left, no one bothered to come call on me. And nobody visited me. And nobody even really knew who I was. I came in and came and came out. And, and that's a valid concern. But I will add this. I always ask those individuals, before you give up on the church, how many people have you called on? And how many people have you visited? And how many people have you taken out and shown hospitality and been a help to? Because you're just as responsible as they were, right? We're all called to this if we have the love of Christ. Now, who are these people, all these names? Well, let's run through them quickly. In verses 3 and 4, we see the beginning of the first group I want to mention. The first group is the group of people who Paul says they labored for Christ. They are distinguished as being those who have worked and risked their lives for the Lord. We see here Aquila and Priscilla. Though it's not written that way in this verse, in verse 3, notice it's Priscilla and Aquila. Very important point, which I will explain in a moment. Aquila was a tent maker. It seems that when the Roman emperor, in around the year A.D. 49, Claudius expelled all of the Jewish people from Rome, Aquila and Priscilla, being Jews, had to leave the city of Rome. And we are told in the book of Acts that they went to Corinth, where they met Paul, possibly became followers of Jesus through the ministry of Paul. And they showed him hospitality. They showed him love and encouragement and cooperation. And so they built a relationship with him in Corinth while they were refugees there for a time. In fact, we are told that Apollos showed up in Corinth and that they invested in this man named Apollos and they taught him and they mentored him. They were great servants of God. And in Acts chapter 18, when Paul went to Ephesus, they set sail with him and they followed him. And their friendship was so close. Verse 4, they even risked their necks for his life. In other words, they were willing to lay down their lives for him. This is love in action. This is sacrifice. This is giving till it hurts, right? Someone once wisely said, it's not how much you give, it's how much you keep that often tells the condition of your heart. And I would say in relationships, that can be very true sometimes. They were willing to give their all because they loved Paul. What did Jesus say in John 15? Greater love has no one in this than a man would what? Lay down his life for his friends. Some of you parents in here, you have laid down your lives for your children, for your grandchildren. Oh, we thank God. God for you. Some of you here in this room have sacrificed and laid down your lives for your brothers and sisters in here. You have helped them and then gone beyond the call of duty and then taken five steps past that call of duty to show Jesus concern. And I want you to know that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It is never empty if you're doing it for Jesus. Now what's kind of cool about this verse is the wife's name is listed first, not the husband's. Priscilla and Aquila. Ladies, pay attention to this. This is important here. Could it be that in the kingdom of God, in the work of God, Paul considered her work to rank higher than that of her husband Aquila? I think the fact that her name comes first testifies of her labor and her sacrifice for the work of Jesus, her usefulness. She deserves to be mentioned with other great women in the Bible, like Lydia and Phoebe and the Marys at the cross and the women at the empty tomb. And I love the fact that the Bible always lifts up women. You know, the Bible has often been accused of being misogynist and being against women, and that Christianity has hampered women. But the fact of the matter is, wherever the gospel has went, women have been lifted up because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To list women's names in a document in the first century, unheard of in that day and age. Yet the Bible has many women that are heroes. By the way, not just in the first century. You go to the Old Testament, women are named, books are named after women, Esther and Ruth, right? The Bible, God has always lifted up women high. 
A friend of mine in the ministry, Pastor Al Stout here in Pensacola, wrote an interesting statement this week that I want to share. He said, no, Christianity did not invent marriage. Listen to this. It glorified marriage. One way it did this is when the minister of the gospel turns away from the groom and looks at the bride in the face and asks these words, Will you take this man? The pagans of the West never turned to the bride to ask her anything. But Christianity, they did. You see, friends, women were never given precedence. They were never put on lists of honor. They never stood as witnesses. But who are the witnesses of Jesus on the cross? Women. Who are the first witnesses of the empty tomb? Women. Who are the witnesses of the resurrected Jesus? It was women. Jesus had friendships with women, with Mary and Martha. Jesus went and talked to that woman at the well in Samaria in John 4 when no one else would have spoken to her. You see, my friends... The status of Roman women was very low in Jesus' day and in Paul's day. Roman law placed a wife under the absolute control of her husband, who had ownership of her as well as all possessions. He could divorce her if she went out in public without a veil. A husband had the power of life and death over his wife, just as he did his children. As with the Greeks, women were not allowed to speak in public, which is why it was huge that Jesus spoke to Martha and Jesus spoke to that woman in John 4 and the woman who had the issue of blood. In many countries in the world today, women must be veiled. In Saudi Arabia, women are barred from driving an automobile. In many Islamic countries, a man has the right to beat and sexually desert his wife all with the full support of the Quran. All the very opposite of what the Bible says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. My friends, here in Romans 16, women hold great preeminence. They are not necessarily the spiritual leaders of the church, but they are great spiritual examples of the church. We see here, one woman is a wife. One is a single woman, another is a mother, yet all of them gave valuable service for the Lord. I would say to anyone who says that Paul was a bigot or a misogynist to read Romans 16 and see that the gospel has always elevated women, has shown that Galatians 3.28 is true. In Christ, there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, we are all one in Christ Jesus. We complement each other. Different roles, different giftings, united and equal in Christ Jesus. God took Eve from the side of Adam, not from the foot of Adam. Amen, ladies? And we need to remember that this day. Now, this continues on. Look at verse 6. Mary labored. Verse 12. Tryphena, Tryphosa, labored. Exhausting work, by the way, restricted to the ministry of women here. Persis, in verse 12, labored much. Or the ESV translate this most accurately. Has, past tense, worked hard in the Lord. Meaning that she is elderly now. Persis is no more able to work hard in the Lord as she has in the past, but her labors are not forgotten. And I thank God for some of our senior saints in the room today, those of you men and women who have labored for Jesus in the past. Please know your labor has not been in vain, and we thank God for each and every one of you. Amen? Are you all asleep or something? Amen, right? We thank God for each and every one of you. Verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker. Tertius, verse 22, the scribe who worked and wrote the letter for Paul. Gaius, verse 23, who was a host and the host of the whole church. You see, we are saved to serve. We are saved to labor for the Lord, to be his hands and feet, and to show his love. Do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. My friends, many of us want to serve God, but it's only in an advisory capacity. That's bogus, okay? He has not called you to serve him in an advisory 
capacity. He's the one on the throne. We are the one who worship him. And we are called to this. I love the fact that as we read this section, not all of us are great theologians. Not all of us are apostles or prophets. Not all of us are elders. Not all of us are deacons. But we are all called to be faithful in what God has given us. I love a story from the old days of the Salvation Army, General William Booth and his son, Bramall. William Booth was a strong evangelical gospel preacher. And his son, Bramwell, was given the difficult task of telling his father, who had lost his eyesight, that there would be no recovery. There was nothing the doctors could do. The general said to his son, Do you mean that I am blind? His son Bramwell said, I fear we must contemplate that. The father continued, I shall never see your face again. The son said, no, probably not in this world. Then General Booth said these words, I have done what I could for God and for his people with my eyes. Now I shall do what I can for God and for his people without my eyes. That should be our heart. Whatever God enables me to do, I will do for his glory. We see another set of people mentioned throughout this passage. Believers. Just simple statements. Verse 5. Epineatus, the first Christian in Asia, the first believer. I ask you how many of you have met and had your first convert? Someone you've prayed with to receive Jesus. Someone you have invested in and brought to church and seen them come to the Lord for the first time. How many of you have had that experience? It's what we're called to, whether it's a child or a cousin or a neighbor or a total stranger, and they've come to Jesus. That should be our heart. Verse 8, Amplius, he is beloved. Persis, verse 12, beloved. Rufus, chosen, elect of God, a choice Christian, chosen of God. Verse 14, Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, five men and the brothers with them. Verse 15, Philologus, Julia, Nereus, his sister, Olympus, all these saints. Erastus, verse 23, the treasurer of the city. Quartus, a brother. You see, they're all united together in one common thing. They all know Jesus and have been loved by him and saved by him. That's the communion of the saints. We see a third group in verse 7. Adronicus and Junia. They not only loved God and were saved and served, but they were prisoners. They had suffered for their faith. May we not forget in this day and age in which persecution may increase those who suffer for their faith, those who are imprisoned for their faith, those who are just prisoners, maybe not even for their faith. What is true Christianity? Matthew 25 says, When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. May we be a church that shows love to prisoners, to those who suffer. In verse 10, we see a fourth group. Apelles was approved. He was faithful. He was found trustworthy of the gospel and of his charge. Oh, that not only would we have a gift and use our gift, but we would be faithful in our gift. I heard a preacher say many, many years ago that Satan is more faithful than most believers or most church members because at least he shows up every Sunday to cause problems. May we be a people that are faithful. What did Paul say? He said it's required of stewards, 1 Corinthians 4, 2, that they would be found faithful. We see a fifth group, households. In verse 3, the church that's meeting in the house. In verse 10, the household of Aristobulus. By the way, the way this is spoken of, he doesn't greet Aristobulus, he greets his household. I think there's two options here as to why that is. Option A, Aristobulus has died, but his household is still alive and following Jesus. Option B, his wife, his children, his household are saved. Aristobulus is not saved. And there are many here today that come to church and not everyone in their home is a believer, a follower of Jesus. I remember reading Spurgeon on this text and Spurgeon held to the idea that Aristobulus was not a believer but his family was. And he said, where are you, Aristobulus? 
That might not be your name, but it is your character. Your family knows the Lord, and I speak to you in God's name. Good words and comfortable words to your wife and to your children that I cannot say to you today, Aristobulus. The Lord sends a message of grace to your dear child, to your beloved wife, but not to you, for you have not given your heart to him. Verse 11, the household of Narcissus. These are all families that know Christ and follow Christ. What joy that is when families worship together. We think of the covenants and the promises to you and to your children and to as many as afar off as the Lord our God will call. The sixth group. And then we end. People of the same country. When Paul says this over and over, people of the same country, I think he means people of Jewish descent. So in verse 7, Andronicus and Junia are from the same country. In verse 11, Herodian is a countryman. In verse 21, Lucius and Jason and Sosipater are my countrymen. But I will point you to the fact that the rest are not Paul's countrymen. Meaning that the communion of the saints is bigger than just being a Jew or just being American or just being your ethnicity. It's bigger than all that, isn't it? You read these names, they're not just funny sounding, they're pagan names. I mean, the first name we read, Phoebe, her name is derived from pagan mythology, being another name for Artemis, the radiant moon goddess, also identified with the Roman goddess Diana. You read the names Junia and Ampliatus and Urbanus and Hermes, verse 14, a famous messenger of the gods. In other words, the church is made up of people who have a messy past, maybe a pagan past, a rebellious past, but they have a great future because they've met the Lord Jesus. It's not about your past. It's about what God's going to do in the future in your life. Such were some of you, Paul says, but you have been washed. You have been regenerated. You have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In your past, Paul says, you do not be deceived. The unrighteous cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The sexually immoral, idolaters, uh, adulterers, those men who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Such were some of you. We might have had a messed up past, but look, the church is for messy people who have a perfect Jesus who changes them and gives them a good future. That's the gospel. That's the communion of saints. Two more thoughts. Verse 16. I know you all were wondering about this one. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Holy Batman, what's that all about, right? Greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, it's important to say, number one, that the word holy is attached to the word kiss because there are unholy kisses. Judas, Jesus said to him, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? That was an unholy kiss. This is a holy kiss, meaning that there should always be three parties, the two that are kissing in God. Now, the word holy guards us against un, any unholy associations. In 1 Peter 5, 14, the Bible says, Greet one another with the kiss of love. You see, in the first century, it was culturally a norm for when two men or two women would, would meet each other that they had not seen each other for a while, to, as we give fist bumps in our very removed society, or high fives, or hopefully the side hug, They would actually give a holy kiss in the first century. Now, Justin Martyr, the early church father, explains exactly what would happen in the early church. He indicates that at the moment of the service in which prayers concluded, we would greet one another with a kiss, the men with the men, the women with the women. This was not a sensual or sexual act. This was, again, like a handshake or a hug or a fist bump in today's day. In fact, J.B. Phillips, the Bible translator, rendered this this way. Give one another a hearty handshake all around for my sake. Holy embraces all around. If you were in Eskimo land, this would be rub noses all around. In the jungle, rub elbows, right? An affectionate greeting. I heard John MacArthur preach about when the MacArthur Study Bible was first published into Russia. And after the Iron 
wall, the curtain had fallen. And John MacArthur went there to distribute the Bibles to pastors. And in Moscow, on that day, 1,600 pastors from all over Russia, leading regional pastors, came to get their first copies of the Bible. And they were so thrilled, and they crammed this big room, all of these men. And in Russia, culturally, when they're thrilled, the men kiss you on the lips. And John MacArthur said, that's a bad custom, because there are no breath mints in Russia. <laughs> the point of this is there's a familial care. Greet one another in this way with love. I don't recommend a holy kiss in 2015, but I do recommend a holy fist bump or handshake or high five or a hug in the name of the Lord. And then this ends, the churches of Christ greet you. Now Paul's not in the city of Rome. He's in Corinth, but he's speaking for all the churches. My friends, we need to remember the communion of saints means the church is bigger than Klondike. The church is bigger than Southern Baptist. The church is bigger than Baptist. There's Presbyterians in this town who love Jesus. There's Methodists in this town who love Jesus. There are Anglicans in this town who love Jesus. There's charismatic, non-denominational, Pentecostal churches in this town that love Jesus. There are churches that are not affiliated, that love Jesus. It's not about the name of the church, it's about the name of the one they love and serve. Amen. The, the churches of Christ greet you. If you are united to Jesus, you have this big family. And when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus together united, we will sing and shout the victory. And I want to say to you today, the heart of Paul is we don't have to wait till heaven. We can do it right here on this earth. If we stop going to church and we are the church that God has called us to be. May we leave here, beloved of one another, laborers for Christ, servants of Christ. May we leave here today loving the church at large, not jealous, not competing, but thankful and praying for our brothers and sisters, concerned for those who suffer, rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep, because we serve the same God, the living God, who is alive, who is on the throne, and who is in our hearts this day. And he will be faithful as we follow him. Let's bow together in prayer. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.